This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So I might look a bit ridiculous in this video because I'm wearing this big poofy jacket and my headphones, but the reality is it's like 20 degrees, but like almost zero degrees Fahrenheit wind chill right now. And there's sleet all over the roads and you can't leave the house, which is funny because this video is about a short film that I shot in the mountains up in Colorado, up in Crested Butte in this like $4 million mansion. And the snow up there wasn't as bad as the ice that we get here in Oklahoma. It's like I brought it with me. So 10 hours into driving to the mountains here. And I figure this might be a fun time to make another film because we're gonna be in this like $7 million house like up in the mountains. And I thought maybe I could use this as a challenge, a location to like make a short horror film or something. So the challenge is basically like, you know, come up with an idea in the car, try to shoot at the house, do it all really fast just to see what I can come up with. Um, and I think I've already, I think I was only thinking about it for like 30 minutes, already came up with an idea, but I don't really know what I'm gonna do until I get into the house and really like can explore the landscape and see what I can shoot there. But it should be fun just trying to make something in a random location like this. You know, I'm supposed to be on vacation, but why not also make a film? I brought all my gear, put it in the car, of course, uh, just in case I wanted to do this. So I think I should just try it. Uh, yeah, I'm waiting for everyone to get coffee. Um, okay, bye. So that's exactly what I did. We were in the car, we were driving, and I was trying to come up with some ideas. I knew that my niece would be there. I knew that she would love to be in it. And it'd be nice to get some different faces in there. So I used Amanda this time too, because I want to be able to film this short film um, without me being in it this time. So I could film it faster and have more control. Not to say that I'm going to stop doing that. I'm probably going to still film more short films with me in it because of just the practical sense of that. But for this one, I wanted to use someone else. So I did. So once again, it's not like true actors or anything, but it was still fun non nonetheless. And if you remember, the reason I'm making these short films on the channel is just to practice. I'm not trying to make award winning work every time. I'm just trying to practice, flex the muscles. And it's really working. I actually learned a lot of lessons from the short film. Film. It's definitely not perfect by any means and I learned so much from it And once we kind of break down the cinematography and the gear I use for this We will go over some of those things that I learned while making this short film You're probably gonna want to go watch the short film first before we talk more about how I made it There'll be a link to that in the description below so I've never made a horror short film before, but lately I've been watching a lot of David F. Sandberg's little short films that he has put on YouTube. I'm very inspired by him. You can go find his channel in the link below. Um, his tag is Pony Smasher. And I wanted to do something similar. You know, he's very good at taking like very simple ideas, very simple concepts, just like in a house doing like three minute horror shorts and they're executed so well. Now I knew that I couldn't probably make something quite as good as him, but I wanted to attempt to do something basically in that kind of same vein and tonality. So I was trying to come up with some ideas and then it dawned on me that Amanda had brought her tarot cards with her up to the mountains. I was like, this is perfect. We can use a tarot card as inspiration for the creepiness that's gonna be inside the film. Let me tell you, making this film was not easy. Once the shooting was done and I went to edit, I edited for maybe one or two days and then I lost half the timeline for some reason when I was trying to do some special effects on it. Um, it was very unfortunate. I've never actually had DaVinci Resolve fail on me before, but for some reason, just half my timeline disappeared. Luckily, I had already exported a version of the film already, so I just threw that back into the timeline and used that as a guide to re-edit the first two minutes of the film. Very strange that DaVinci had these issues, but um, hopefully that doesn't happen again in the future. Okay, so before we talk too much about just the film itself and what I learned, let's talk about the cinematography. I know a lot of you guys follow this channel because of my cinematography techniques, so let's just talk about the gear I use and that sort of thing. So first off, I shot this one on my red Komodo with the Mikey Cinema lenses. I also use the Canon Speed Booster for this. Now, the only reason I use the Canon Speed Booster for this was I wanted to just make sure I could get wide enough. And when I, but Mikey 24 millimeter is the widest lens that I have in the Cine kit. And so when you put the Speed Booster on, that kind of makes it basically like an 18 millimeter to have the option to go wider and the option to go more shallow if I wanted to. But really when it comes to narrative work, you don't need to shoot that shallow. There's a lot of like, you know, TV series and stuff right now that are shot pretty shallow, like on Red Monstros and Alexa 65s and LFs. And you can go shallow when doing narrative work, but I found that most of the stuff that I like really isn't that shallow. You know, you guys know I like Roger Deakins. His stuff really isn't that shallow. He's really at T2A, T4 most of the time because you want to see what's going on in the frame when you're looking at narrative work. You want to see what the story is telling you, what the background is about the texture, you want to get you know immersed into the environment. So a lot of times you don't want to go too shallow in that. But I love having the option to go shallow if I want to. 
That's why I use the speed booster. So really I haven't been shooting raw that much on this camera. I know I've touted raw a lot, but for these little short films and stuff, I've just been using 4K ProRes on the, on the red Komodo here. And it's just really nice because it down samples from the 6K sensor. And then also adds just a smidge of noise reduction, which just makes things nice and clean and easy to work with in post for me. You know, if I'm doing a commercial job though, I'm always shooting red raw and I want all that latitude there, all that color depth there. But for this sort of thing, I've just been shooting with the ProRes option on the camera. And the Mikey's perform really well on this. Um, it's just really nice to have cinema lenses that you can get a really nice focus throw on. You can change your aperture to wherever you want. Um, and it's just really easy using the Mikey lenses on this. So I mostly shot on the Mikey 35 millimeter. That's just kind of wide enough when you're shooting in that 240 aspect ratio. But I do wish I would have shot on the 24 more and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. Just from a narrative standpoint, I wish I would have paid more attention to getting close-ups. But the 35 and 50 is mostly what I shot on. Um, and that just made things wide enough in this house to capture what I wanted to capture and keep me not too far from the subject. So I use the 35 millimeter for most occasions, but then I would put on the 50 if I needed to get some sort of insert close up. And so I mostly shot between T21 and T56, mostly T28-ish kind of area. Given that I was using a lot of practical light and I only use my Nanlite Pavo tubes to light this. So let's talk about a couple of the lighting scenarios that I had in this house. So I use a lot of the practical lights and you know the ceiling lights, a lot of the incandescent lights that were already built into the house, but a lot of it was top light and it looked really harsh and kind of gross on like a subject's face. Um, so what I did was just augment most of my light using the Nanlite Pavo tubes. So like for the full opening scene, I had Pavo tube as a key light set to about 2700 Kelvin to kind of get that nice uh, orange incandescent look, probably through some piece of diffusion. And then I was using another Nanlite over by the fireplace acting as like a little firelight. It's probably a little too intense, but um, for what I was doing, and I was trying to film this all in like three hours, I was kind of rushing. It definitely got the job done and definitely sold the fire effect once I put that kind of fire audio in. Now there was a fireplace in the room, but it wasn't bright at all. And I needed bright lights because I was trying to expose for the background. I wanted to, you know, not waste this, this amazing view that we had up there. I wanted to show the mountains off in the background. Also to add a sense of like aloneness, like she's up in the mountains in this huge house all by herself. And there's things happening in the house that are unexplainable. And conveniently enough, the owners of this house had some shades that you could throw down in front of the windows that would take away like two or three stops of light um, because this light gets really bright off that snow, off the mountains inside that house. So I was able to put those shades down and that cut the light a lot off the background so I could expose for the background while exposing for Amanda sitting on the couch. And then I just let the light fall as it would throughout the night. That way it kind of got darker as the film went on. And I just planned all this accordingly. I made sure to like start shooting at five o'clock and let the light fall. And then by the end of it, I had the, the shades up and then the light was almost gone at the very end. So I just kind of had to plan for that and make sure I got all the shots in the living room before I moved on. That way I could have those mountains exposed in the background, which is usually really hard uh, to do, but those shades really helped. They basically acted as some sort of ND for me so I could see what was going on in the background. So I always just put the Nanlite Pavo 2 up. It was uh, probably 100%. Um, I always put it long ways, you know, most of the time long ways horizontal, that way you get the softest light you can. And then a piece of diffusion in front of that to soften it even more usually. But a lot of the times I just had the Nanlite bare bulb um, either shooting into a ceiling or, you know, just off to the side shooting at Amanda for most of these shots. So like going down the staircases and stuff, I had to just use the practical lights in the room for that because I thought the incandescence bouncing off of the wood looked really nice as is. But like for the for when like the lights get cut off from her, I had one of the nan lights set to a bluish color temperature up on the stairwell acting as a little bit of moonlight coming down through the stairwell. And then when I went to do that shot, all I did was hit record and run over to the lights and then flip the Nan light switch off. I and mean, I just only had that light on in the room except for one little light in the background. And that's how I was able to kind of give that effect of the lights going out. But I said the Nan light just like up above her on the far side of her face, just to add a little bit of context, a little bit of like light coming from the ceiling. And then I just clicked it off myself to get that shot. And so it's really always the intention is like, okay, where's the lamp in the room? Okay, the lamp's over here. I'm gonna put my subject on the other side of the lamp and then I'm gonna put my Nan light Pavo tube 
somewhere around where the lamp might be to wrap some of that light around and be able to control the light because the lamps, like a lamp in the room is never gonna give enough light unless you put the subject right next to it. So the same thing went for upstairs. There was a lamp upstairs and I used it for the wide shot just as is. But once we got closer in, I would just put a Pavo tube in the corner by the lamp just to throw a lot more light towards the subject. And with this one, I didn't wanna to go too heavy on the lighting. The thing is when you're a cinematographer, you're always thinking about adding more lights and whatnot. And especially when you're in the, the commercial world, you're always lighting everything to look pretty. But when it comes to narrative, really you want things to look natural. You want things to look real. So all I'm doing is trying to augment a little bit of light motivated by something else that's already in the room just to make things look more natural and practical. And so for all the scenes that were lit kind of with that window, the big, you know, mountain viewed window, I put a Nanlite Pavo tube set to not even just a blue color temperature, but to an actual blue hue on the RGB spectrum to help add that kind of blue color on Amanda's face. Um, so when we go to the close up there, you know, originally, the wide shot is just using the natural light and then there's a little bit of firelight coming from behind them. But then once we get to her close up, I just put enough of that blue light um, on her face to just act like there's a little bit of blue light still coming in from the window, even though it probably didn't match at all. I think it totally works. And then I've always, always have that fireplace light basically in the background if I need fire. And also in that wide shot there, you can tell um, there's something else going on. There's like a dog in the shot. So my friend Easton, who you've seen on the channel before, Easton Oliver, he's helped me out. Um, he's been learning like, a lot of 3D animation stuff recently using like Blender or Unreal Engine. So I was like, hey, can you make a dog for me? Because I don't know if anyone caught the reference, but the, the Fool, if you're into tarot cards, the Fool usually is some sort of kind of like jester-like character um, with like a dog. And so I made my niece the Fool um, and she's got like her little knapsack, like she's on the road. And then I didn't have a dog handy for the shoot. And whether you get the reference or not, that doesn't matter. I think a dog being in the shot was creepy alone. Like, why is this dog? in this house and this owner doesn't have a dog. Maybe it's a wolf. What is it? He was able to download like a $12 statue and turn it into a dog. He even like animated the ears and made it move around a little bit. So look a lot closer next time you watch it and you'll really be able to see that it's definitely not real. But for, for this and like these short shots, I think it really sold that kind of dog look without even having a dog. Um, and then he even animated on the fire on the background of the dog, just like my Nanlite was doing for my niece and Amanda. So I wish I would have set up that shot a lot better. Like if I would have known I was gonna use a dog originally Maybe I would have moved the couch out of the way or maybe I would have shot a little bit lower so their silhouettes looked better. Um, and I originally like colored them kind of silhouette but when I showed it to a couple of people, they're like, I can't even see that there's a person in the frame. So I ended up brightening up these shots. And you know, think, think about horror, you think that your shots should be really dark, but really you need to see some of the things that are going to scare you. So I ended up just brightening, brightening that up and I think it worked pretty well. So that was one visual effects thing that I did not plan for. Um, I needed to cut back to that wide shot in front of the mountains and not have my niece there anymore and so I manually went through and cut her out in DaVinci uh, Fusion and that took so long and it was a painstaking process and it looks terrible if you look really closely but for that three second shot it totally gets the job done and it's no big deal. I would have just shot a plate or shot it without her in it if I would have thought that I needed that shot. But once you get into editing and you're doing something narrative, sometimes you realize, oh man, I really need a reaction here. I need a reaction here. And it makes things pretty difficult when you're trying to wing a short film like that. So yeah, mostly for all the cinematography, I didn't do anything complicated. Use that nan light. Use a lot of practicals in the room for fill light or yeah, I didn't actually use a lot of negative fill on this one. I wanted to keep everything nice and dark. Um, so I use my my usual Cine Vibes LUTs. I mean, you know, my Roger that LUT that already kind of darkens the image for me. Um, and then I just used a lot of extra light for the key lights. And then my wife was wearing black. So that also helped with the contrast in the scene. So I only had a tripod for this as well. I had just had my little Benro tripod. It's more of the travel tripod, which made things hard, but that totally got the job done. And I did a couple handheld shots at the very end just to kind of speed things up. But for the most part, I just shot on the tripod, which brings me into talking more about the film and some of the intentionality behind that. But before we talk about that, I wanna talk about today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Now, if you're a filmmaker or a cinematographer, you're probably looking for a place to present your work online and Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to just do that. You can start with one of their pre-existing templates to get going or build a site from scratch. You know, I've been using Squarespace for a better part of a decade now, and I just like the usability of it, the customization of it. You can change things whenever you want on the fly. They even have like an app for it. So you can go into the back end of your website and change things if you need to. What I really like is when, you know, people are reaching out for me for projects and stuff, they can just fill out a contact form right there on the page. And you know that it's like a job inquiry and it's something serious rather than just like a random email. And then you can do everything 
through that, really know why, why people are contacting you. For me, that just helps keep those client inquiries organized for me because I just know they're always gonna come through as that form submission. And of course, you can put your work on there. You can embed videos however you want through YouTube or Vimeo and you know move those around however you please. So if you're anything like me and you need to put yourself online, well, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off. And I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So let's talk about some lessons learned here. Um, first off, visual effects. What am I, what was I thinking? Visual effects? I really never had planned to do that, but at the end, I, you know, since I was kind of inspired by David F. Sandberg, Pony Smasher, he's always like really good at make, kind of making the character at the end become a demon and he, you know, white eyeballs and these crazy faces. And I wanted to be a lot more subtle than that, a little bit more grounded since I was basing everything off the tarot card. And I knew that I probably couldn't, you know, in this short amount of time, uh, pull that off. So I did I did try to do um, the white eyes. I don't think they look that great because I was teaching myself um, fusion in the process. And then I ended up just trying to do like kind of a lo-fi version of it. Um, and I did, and I learned a lot. So I think next time, if I want to do that, I probably could do a lot better job. But I was trying to get this film done fast. I was trying to, you know, I'm trying to exercise quickly here. But based on some business scheduling, I didn't really have the opportunity to wait anyway. So this is what I came up with, and that's fine. These are just practice films. So as usual, I, you know, I edited everything in DaVinci Resolve. And of course I color graded everything with my Cinevibe LUT pack, the Roger That version two LUT for this one, you know, tweaked a little bit obviously for this type of film. So if you wanna check those out, they'll be in the description box below. And as far as audio went, I did the old uh, get it in post trick again, because it's hard to also operate audio while you're directing and shooting. Um, so I just did everything in post. Actually, I used Epidemic Sound for a lot of the audio cues that you hear in this. You know, the stings and the hits, those kind of like bongs, I got those from Epidemic Sound, and then as well as a bunch of the little Foley sounds. And then I just went through my house when I got home with Amanda and a little, you know, my little baby lavalier here. And I uh, went through and just plugged that into my phone and got like her little, some footsteps here and there, some of her gasps, you know, some things that kind of liven up the film because I couldn't get those on the day of. And that really actually makes things really nice and clean doing it that way. Um, Cause you can just have control of the audio first trying to capture it live. But like the little baby noise and the dog noise, I got all those from Epidemic Sound. And the little music bits that you hear in this were, you know, custom scored by my friend, Matt Schuber, who's been helping me out on films right now. So if you wanna check out his work, you can find it in the description below. So yeah, from a narrative standpoint, I did learn a lot. Going through, I really felt like I wanted it to be kind of mysterious and kind of like what's going on. So originally I had Amanda just kind of walking around like that. But once I got it into the computer and started editing it, I, did, I realized that, you know, the character really adds a lot of that scaredness to the to the scene. So if I could have had her to be more scared herself and they got a lot more close-ups of her being scared, you know, a lot, a lot more gasps, a lot more of that kind of like running away kind of feel, that would really help add a lot more of that, you know, scariness, that like that tension to the audience. So in the future, I'm definitely gonna lean more on that technique versus kind of just like this like slow building technique, which I did want to play with as well. I'd never really, really played with that before. So that was really fun. I've never made a horror film. So I did enjoy that side of it. Maybe even some more POV shots. Like what is she looking at? What is she afraid of? These are all practice films. This is like, I feel like a lot of people in our previous generations didn't get the opportunity to make practice films before they went off to Hollywood. And I have the ability, I have all the gear and the time to do so. So why not just practice? These are not perfect films. They're not amazing films. And that's not what I'm trying to go for here. I'm trying to learn and what's the best way of learning? It's practicing. And speaking of that, I've noticed that maybe the narrative stuff isn't as appealing to the audience that I already have here now. So let me know in the comments below if you are enjoying it. And let me know if you want to see some more cinematography stuff, because obviously I still do that and I have no problems making some more videos here on the channel that are cinematography related. So if you miss that kind of stuff, let me know in the comments below. I'd really appreciate it. And if so, I'll start making a couple more cinematography videos here going forward. So coming up here on the channel, I'm going to be trying to do some more short films, obviously. Maybe I'll be in some, but I'm going to try to get some actors for once, because I think that's really the thing holding me back at this point, is that I've got all the other technicalities figured out, but I need some some actors to really help sell the emotion and make something that might be a little bit better than the things that I've been making in the past. So definitely subscribe if you wanna see more of that kind of content. And if you have any questions on how I shot this film and how I did anything in it, just let me know in the comments below. And until next time guys, I'm Spencer Sakurai, see ya.